Okay, so let's have a class, and uh, we will uh, just come in. Um, we will talk about is uh, uh, last session of the protein. Uh, we first will talk about gel gelation, and we also call it is uh, gel formation. Uh, so first the question is, what is gel? Uh, this is, we usually say, a large amount of immobilized the water. Well, I will say it is interactive with chemical bonds from, uh, not uh, from, uh, with chemical bonds to free amino acids or amino acids in polypeptide or protein. And it is an uh, intermediate phase between liquid and solid. So between solid and liquid. And uh, the gel formation, once it's formed, it is characterized by three important characteristics, which is we call it a high elasticity uh, viscosity and uh, plasticity. So what are the gonna be the process usually? You have a solid status, will become pro-gel, then you become gel. There are some of the examples for gel formation. Some of them you already know. For example, egg mayonnaise. For example, a traditional Asian Chinese food tofu, even yogurt, and another one, not really a food, but we mentioned it's gel, <coughs> uh, gelatin. Okay, so these are the some of the examples. Now, we could draw a brief. Um, connection, how the gel formation has been formed. So let's say I have an amino acid. We have an amino group, and we know there is a side chain R and H and the carboxy group. So this is one amino acid. Then I have another amino acid. I do a little bit switch. So COH is right here, center is still C and H. This is going to be R2, and this is going to be NH2. So they think the gel formation, once they formed, the amino acid and the carboxy group right here, they are connected with some of the chemical bonds. And their chemical bonds could be Hydrogen bonds, relatively weak, could be ionic bonds, we mentioned about earlier, could be covalent bonds, which is relatively strong, or we say uncovalent bonds, but hydrophobic bonds. That is important, especially in the egg mayonnaise. 
Now, we know that the geoformation is a large amount of the immobilized of water. So we think this whole thing, still lots of water. How many water are there? It is 98% is still water. But what are the status? They think this geo, there's a lot of these individual, we call it pore, or like a hole. And then these filled with water, most of them are capillary water. So we talk about uh, loosely abound uh, additional layer, mono layer, capillary water, and then they will be generated capillary force, so like a surfactant, and then to connect it with it. Okay, so this is basically the overview picture of what the geoformation looks like. Now, we, in our textbook, it's also writing a formula to explain the geoformation which is NPN. So we think this N is the number of protein. And we think this PN is natural status of protein. And then, most of the time, once the gel formation, they need heat. So you're going to have to do heating. So we also call it a heating-induced gel. Once it's generated with, uh, using the heat, what will happen is denaturing. So that will become NPD. And this represents denaturing of protein. Now, the nature of protein, typically in the gel formation, we also call it is an unfold of polypeptides. Now, once this happens, at the intermediate status, they go two different directions. When they go here, they will be cooling down then become PDN. So what this means, most of the time, it looks like a collagen heated at the intermediate status, denaturing protein, calling them become gelatin, and this is what we call clear or transparent gel. But it also could be the other side, which is basically you have acid, you have alkaline solution, sometimes has enzyme, and other chemicals, they will react it, they will generate a, a glutinated gel. And obviously this gel is opaque, which means untransparent, it's glutinated, okay? So this is a formula which is we talk about that. Now from here, we could say there is basically two steps happened for the gel formation. Number one is denaturing, which means unfolding of polypeptides, and the number two steps steps is gel matrix formation. They need to form in the matrix. Now with this formula, we could have some uh, thing we can talk about, uh, have a different category of the gel. So the first category what we could talk about is clear gel versus a glutinated gel. Yeah. Or we say aggregated gel, sorry. 
uh, agglutinated or we say aggregated. So let's just change this code. Aggregated gel. That will be a two different one pair. Now, uh, what are the differences between that? First thing, a clear gel is usually small particle. And this is usually a large particle. And there, there is a research has been showing if in the gel formation you have 32%, 32% of more percent of uh, losing um, phenylalanine, and you have a uh, um, Violin, tryptophan. Let me see an, another cup of um, tryptophan. Uh, Isoleucine. Then, most likely, it will have aggregated. Well, with the assumption, water is so is solvent. Okay. The reason is we know all of these five amino acids, they are non-polar, no charge, and hydrophobic. So what means hydrophobic? It's not going to be dissolved in the water, so they are tracking the water and will generate a light scatter. So, which is not really reflected the light. So, it looks like it's aggregated. Okay. Now, clear gel usually it's a small particle we judge we generate gener generated. Uh, a good example for the aggregated gel, we mentioned the egg mayonnaise is is one of that, and also like a casing. We will talk casing real quick. Uh, clear gel usually it has a very high water holding capacity. A good example will be wheat protein. Any of the gel coming from the wheat protein, we will talk about. Uh, we will talk about that it's a, a small particle. So this is the first category they talk about. The second category is reversible gel versus irreversible gel. Now this is basically is the difference is a chemical bond. Okay, you, you, reversible gel if it's composed by hydrogen bonds. If it's composed by hydrogen bonds, then most likely it is a reversible gel. In irreversible gel usually it's a very strong covalent bonds. And it also could be a, hyd a hydrophobic bond. Now we know the example irreversible egg mayonnaise is one of the example. And the reversible gel is gelatin. Okay, so these are the something we uh, want to talk. Now another thing we want to mention is the irreversible gel, they also could be happened very often if the protein containing cysteine or the cross link becomes cysteine. Because these will have disulfur bound or hydrosulfur bound. This will be generated what we talked about last section, which is cross-linking. If they cross-link the generated then the gel usually it is irreversible. Okay, next we want to talk about the several of the factors will impact uh, the gel formation. Number one is 
the molecular weight. So the size and the molecular weight of the uh, protein or the amino acids, it is uh, important. Uh, the protein molecular weight is important, and especially for heat uh, induced gel. So basically, we will say it's very easy to have a gel formation if it's more than 23,000 dA delta. And usually we say if the molecular weight less than 20,000, it's not easy to form gel. But how about between that? That's conditionally formed, which means we mentioned it needs disulfur bonds, hydroxy sulfur bonds to generate a cross-linking to help them. So this is the first thing. The molecular weight, that's easily understand. The second one we talk about is the protein concentration. This is another important factor. They also have a formula that could explain which means the, the gel strength can be calculated by the protein concentration, which is equals the protein concentration minus C L E D times the power of N. And this n equals one or two. So what is the LED means? LED is that means least the con oh, sorry LCE least the concentration and the point. Not LED LCE. That means it's a least concentration and point. And this value has been, there is lots of research to set up for some of the products. For example, LCE value for um, solving protein, it is about 8%. For the egg albumin, it is about 6%, sometimes 3 to 6%. For gelatin, it's very small. It is only 0.5 to 0.6%. To use this calculation, we will know the gel strength. The third impact everybody knows is pH. Most of the time, we know the pH will stay in the middle at 7 or 8, 6 or 7. However, to regarding for the gel formation, we the better has a pH close to pi value, isoelectronic points, because at that time will cause a big precipitation. Okay, so the gel formation is easier to have. Last one, we wish limited proteolysis. We don't want, there's some enzymes there, there are proteases there, because those enzymes could, give, could be break down the uh, protein become polypeptides. We don't want that. We want it to have a relatively strong structure. Okay, so these are some of the opening remarks regarding the gelatin and the gel formation. So we want to give you some of the examples for you to understand. And there are two very good examples which is mentioned in our textbook. In two different textbooks, they both mention. Uh, the first one we talk about is egg uh, mayonnaise. So it's, they describe it briefly. First of all, 
This is oil, water, emulsifier. So, or we say emulsification, because we have oil there, we have water there, they're not going to be connected very well. So we need some of the emulsifier for that. So what's an emulsifier? It's egg white. Egg white is a strong emulsifier, they could be connected. So once they're connected, we talk about the gel formation, they need a denature. So they need something to do the denature. What are they? It is acid. So what are the acid will we have there? The egg mayonnaise we usually have uh, lactic acid. Uh, uh, we have uh, a, a, a citric acid and acidic acids. So we generate acidic acids. So where the acidic acids come from? We usually add the vinegar there. Another acid is citric acid. So where are going to be the citric acid to come from? We usually use a lemon juice. And once you have these things together, what you see? It is a yellowish color, the whole thing. Yellowish emulsifier, and you see some of the droplets there. We call emulsifier droplets. Caused by this acid and these uh, the egg whites. This is the reaction. Uh, Ian, can you move this to this side? So that's an egg mayonnaise, is one of the examples. The second example which is the Dr. Fenneman's textbook, which is talk about these TOEFL process. How we made a TOEFL, and uh, it's uh, very in interesting, and uh, uh, we could uh, introduce this one to you. Uh, where the TOEFL comes from? Sorbing. Okay, we need a sorbing. Uh, it's a yellow color, very uh, not expensive, went back about three to five dollars. And uh, we gotta have to do the first step, we have to soak in, soak in, in water. Well, it depends different machines. Some you don't have to soak, some you have to soak overnight, then become, a, we call it a soil slurry. Then what we have to do? We have to obviously heat it. And this heating has to be strong, long time, uh, high temperature, so it looks like a, like a boring. Usually 95 to 100 degrees Celsius, three to five minutes. That's longer time to do it. Then what will generate? Soil milk. Now you can add a sugar there, lactose there to make us Sweeten, sweeten, and become soy milk. What are we gonna do next? We have to grow, uh, ag aggregate it. So what we need to do? We need to add something. Calcium sulfide or magnesium sulfide. And don't forget, we still have to heat. So we heating this time relatively low temperature, 75 degrees Celsius, three to five minutes again. Then what we got? What we have? A curd generator. It is really a good, a good thing. So when we go here, then what we do, we press it. You can use machine or manually press it, generate a V, and we say it's a curd, and a cake. And then what we do, cooling down, then become tofu. Uh, something we have to mention here is we will talk about the we protein very quick. But you should know we is not equals we protein. This is some concept. We, we want to let you know we does not equal we protein. Okay, we protein is a different story. We will mention there are the four major components there. So what is we? 
I'll give you a joke. It's, it's, it's not really true. It's a joke. If we have 10 liter cheese, then one liter is wheat and nine liter is water. So, said very simple, what is wheat? It is a byproduct of cheese. And you can understand that it's a mix of everything. Useful, unuseful, protein, polypeptides, amino acids, chemicals, everything is there. Some people say it's a waste. Some people say it's a variable for nutrition. It's a functional food. And lots of the research, numerous paper, maybe millions of paper published there talk about that. Okay, so this is something I want to uh, talk earlier. We does not equal we protein. It's, it's a different uh, concept. Okay, and this is relatively the joke. And we just let you know a uh, byproducts of cheese. So that's a sentence to describe that. So this section we talk about is the gelatin uh, formation. Our textbook mentioned the very simple, and uh, Dr. Fenneman's book mentioned, but uh, I think it is also uh, here and there. Um, so I concluded everything here, which is a uh, uh, key points what they are to those two textbook mentioned. So the next one we want to mention about is a, a milk protein. Uh, our textbook has uh, uh, fish protein, egg protein, soybean protein, uh, briefly mentioned here and there, but I think that a milk protein is important. So I do want to uh, mention about the milk protein. Because I think it is a, a key topic we should know. Uh, milk protein, the research what they did a long time ago, is coming from skin milk. Uh, skin milk basically is ideal. It is no fat, no fatty acids. And we have uh, whole milk. Whole milk, usually one gallon, you have eight gram of fat. And then you have a reduced 2%, reduced milk. And this is usually have uh, around two gram of the fat. Then you have like some people have 5% reduced, uh, reduced milk, but skin milk is 0% of fat. So we take out of the fatty acids, and we're going to focus on the protein. So what are going to be the milk protein looks like? Milk protein has lots of components. Number one, everybody knows is casein, 78 to 80 percent. It's a major part. The second major part, it's called serine protein, or we refer it as we protein. How many percentage? 17 percent. Okay, what are the next steps? There is left 5%. It is a non-protein nitrogen compound, compounds or components. This is very interesting, uh, the topic. In some of the countries, let's say in China, when they measure it, the amount of the protein in a milk products or in a milk powder, um, they do not use in the methods like a nanny hydro or those things to test. We talk about the last section. What they do is they are testing the nitrogen com uh, com uh, percentage. Well, if your nitrogen percentage reaches a certain level, then we will say your protein amount is enough. So, some of the commercial people were making a fraudulence. What they do, instead of they do a protein, they will add in a chemical which is, has a high amount of the nitrogen, which is like a melamine. This is happened in 2008, there was a big outbreaks about infant milk powder. So they eat the infants, those kids, young baby, to eat those 
uh, milk powder, which is not containing protein, they are containing melamine. What happens? They have a bladder storm and a severe bloody, uh, bloody that like a bladder area. Okay, water diarrhea. So it's a that's that year was a big topic uh, for the food safety regarding the chemical safety. So that's why I want to mention a little bit. But in the milk protein, they do have five percent non-protein nitrogen compounds. Now what else? What else we, we, we have? This add up on almost a hundred percent. There is a trace amount. Trace amount basically is enzyme. So we know there is a perioxidase. There is a um, oxidase. There is an amylase sometimes, a little bit amount, very few, and some other enzymes. Okay, so trace amount is some of the enzymes. Now, we're going to talk about is this casing real quick, but the serum protein we want to mention. The serum protein, there is a different components. The most important one, there is a serum, is lactoglobulin. This is around 8.5%. Uh, the lactoglobulin. Then the second component is we call lactoalbumin. This is a roughly around 5%. And then we have called serian albumin. This is about uh, 3%. If you add up together, then around 0.5 to 1% is immune globally globally what is that that's referred as antibody so the milk products more or less you have some antibody there it's very very interesting so that's an overall picture of the milk protein now we want to talk about this case so there's some topics we could talk, talk could talk about this case Okay, before we talk about that, we want to also mention how we isolate about this. Uh, a long time ago, I remember when I was master students in China, people are interested about the milk protein. We can use a biochemical uh, material to the procedure to isolation these uh, proteins, and then we're using a peptides. Uh, uh, sorry, some of the enzymes, like pepsin, to hydrolyze it. They generate lots of the biological function peptides. Some of them could be antimicrobials. Uh, let's say lactoglobulin. Uh, you use pepsin, you get a pepsin, lactoglobulin. The peptides could be um, killing the bacteria. Uh, that was the first time when I touched the microbiology a long time ago, almost like 20 years ago. So just, just want to let you know. Now, we're not going to go very detailed about how we isolate that, but our textbook did tell some brief methods we could get to isolation. So how we do the isolation? If you have a skin milk, and I want to say the procedure is ideal, okay? Relatively, if you buy a skin milk from the market, you basically cannot do that because it's way much of the other ingredients. Skin milk at 20 degrees Celsius. We adjust the pH to 4.6. And then what we do is we do a centrifuge, we got a precipitants and the filter parts. So what are the precipitants part? Precipitation parts. This case. Now, what are the future parts? Is we protein. So that's the first thing. This means casing the PI value close to 4.6 at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, now we have a we protein. We're going to have to do something. We could do 0 0.5 saturation 
with ammonium sulfide. We could also do 100% saturation with magnesium sulfide. Then what we get? We get lactoglobulin and lactoalbumin. So the precipitation part is lactoglobulin and the future part is lactoalbumin. This is a very easy way to do, but it will be a very crude component, which means not everything is casing, not everything is lactoglobulin. You only use this, this method, okay? So but just want to let you know, now we're going to talk about this casing. What's a casing we have? So let's talk about casing. Casing have a different components. Uh, this one I'm going to talk about. We have alpha casing, alpha S1, alpha S2. We have a beta casing and we have a gamma casing, a carbon casing, sorry. We have a car carbon casing. Now, what is the ratio for that? It's very interesting. The ratio 3 to 1, 3 to 1. Some of the people will say the ratio beta the carbon casing of 4.5 to 1.5. It's the same thing. Very similar to the Mondal rules when you do the beans, like 9, 3, 3, 1, if you still remember, genetic class, so it looks like similar. Now the next question is, alpha and the beta casing, you can group them together. There are two reasons. One reason, their molecular weight is similar. 23 to 24K delta. Carbon casing is relatively small. 19 to 20K delta. This tells you if you want to feel to uh, do a gel formation, Alpha beta casing is easy to do, kappa casing is relatively difficult to do based on the molecular weight. Okay, now what this means S1, S2? This means sensitive to calcium. What this means if you Mixed with calcium, they will cause precipitation. There is a formula we could draw. If you have a protein, okay, you connect it to a phosphate like this. And then I have a calcium comes. What will be happen? It will become a protein And the calcium, and this causes precipitation. Okay, so here is something we want to introduce you a little bit. Alpha S1, the first thing, they have net charge around 22 at the pH 6.5. Of course, they are sensitive to the casing, but more specifically, they have relatively high amount, 8 to 9 percent, the component is proline, which is this guy. If you remember proline, what it likes, looks like, we mentioned a couple of times, it is a chain. So you have to draw everything. Okay? 
Alpha S2, alpha S2 casing basically relatively low percentage of proline. However, is this has higher percentage of phosphate, so it is highly phosphorated. Okay, the beta casing. Beta casing very similar to alpha S2. High percentage of phosphate. They have different uh, domain. N domain usually hydrophobic. The C terminal domain is hydrophilic. And another thing is this very interesting is beta casing have different function at a four have different phase we can say at a four degrees Celsius it looks like a monomer a mono monomer at eight degrees Celsius or above it is kind of like a polymer. Now, the last one is carbon casing. Carbon casing, it is less sensitive to calcium. But it is important. How we make a cheese? You can use different methods. What is the easiest way to make cheese? Is milk adding a very magical stuff called a rainy. It will become a cheese. Why we can do it? Because the rainy is like a scissor. It will slice casing to let the carbon casing there hydrophilic ends will be exposed. Okay, once exposed, it's easy to react it with water, become a glyco macro water soluble compounds. So that's very interesting. Well, we have all these things. Okay, so this is what we talk about here. Okay, next one. Uh, this is not enough. We have to took something out. Lactoalbumin. Lactoalbumin, we want to talk about several things. I'll just draw like that. Lactoalbumin, first of all, the molecular weight, it is around 90,000 K. They all have a higher amount rich in lysine, leucine, uh, glutamic acids, and aspartic acids. They have uh, two different genetic variants. We call it AB variant. And it is very interesting. This A variant has a huge amount of system. What is this one? We know this system, what it looks like. Have a cross linking with system we measure. Why this is important? If you heated a milk, usually you have a very special flavor. Some people doesn't like it because it's from this system at the lacto. Oh, sorry. No, I, I, sorry, I messed up. I'm not talking about the, 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 this guy. These are is for lacto globulin. So it's for lacto globulin. Okay, lacto globulin is a molecular weight 90,000, uh, 19K. 
uh, rich in leucine, uh, lysine, leucine, glutamine, astamic acids, AB variant, a high amount of the cysteine, and this will contribute, we say, it is for the uh, cooked milk flavor. Um, the, that is for cooked milk, milk, milk flavor. And the last thing we want to talk is um, they are secondary structure with alpha helixy and beta sheet. And it has an internal, we call it an in, internal hydro. Ends. Okay, so that is what we talk about is lacto uh, globally. Lacto albumin. Um, just to be very briefly, this is also had an AB variant. The molecular weight around the 14K uh, DA. Not much we talk about that. This guy you should know. You should know that this guy already in different classes. What is that? Antibody. IgA, IgG, IgM, hemoglobin. They are connected with We call it a disulfur bonds. We have this heavy chain and this light chain. The heavy chain have 50,000 amino acids. The light chain, 20 to 25,000 amino acids. And the top here, we call it is a variable area because it gonna be have connected with antigen to react it. The bottom part we call it the FC section. What we they do? Connected with a macrophage. Macrophage is one.